So, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Web3, but I'm first going to give you a uh, new presentation trying to explain what Ethereum is, so you're kind of guinea pigs. Um, let's see if you understand um, what Ethereum is um, without me mentioning any of the technical bits. So for some of you, that's going to be a pain because you want to know it, but hopefully for some that's actually going to be a change because it'll be the first time I've had the blockchain explained to you or blockchain technology uh, without actually mentioning any of the uh, nitty gritty. So here are some important things to forget. Um, consensus, ledger, ASIC, all that you can forget that. Um, that's not going to come into this uh, presentation. So, um, here's a picture of what they thought a personal computer was going to look like um, by 2004. Look at the Amazon. They, this one runs Fortran, so it's easy to use. Um, it's a computer, that's what it is. And um, that's what Ethereum is. Ethereum is a computer. It's a really slow computer. It runs maybe, at, at best, five times slower than a normal machine. At worst, you know, a hundred times. Much worse. It's really expensive. It costs a lot of money to use. In terms of the actual computation power for, for money and memory that you get, it's probably around the 50s kind of expense. And um, slightly oddly, um, the Ethereum computer is not, it doesn't always kind of know necessarily what the answer is, and may have made up its mind yet. Sometimes it changes its mind. But it's normally fine after a minute. Maybe after 15 seconds it might change its mind. After a minute, it probably so. So far, I'm not really selling it. So, what's actually good about the Ethereum? It's the first computer of which there's only one. There's only one Ethereum computer, and it exists everywhere. It's a universal singleton, global singleton. And in that way, this talk is kind of like the opposite of the last talk, because the last talk's talking about, you know, billions of different computers all kind of running the same sort of software. And this one, there's only one ever in the world. Global signals. Because it's decentralized, it, it can't fail. It can't be stopped. Or at least it can't be stopped without everybody and all their computers stopping. Um, and it can't be censored very easily. And finally, it's ubiquitous. Anywhere there's the internet, there's the Ethereum computer. You can access it, you can use it. But there's more. It's natively multi-user, which means there are many accounts. There are as many accounts as there are you want there to be. Um, technically, there are two to the 160 accounts, but that's kind of more than the number of atoms in the universe, so it doesn't really matter. Um, it's natively object-oriented. There aren't that many computers that are natively object-oriented, a few virtual machines. Um, this one is natively object-oriented. Encapsulation is sort of encoded in the virtual silicon. This notion of the virtual machine actually enforces the encapsulation for the object orientation. It's accessible. You can use it with JavaScript. So if you know JavaScript, you know how to inter interact with the Ethereum computer. And finally, you can make sure that nobody's on, or nobody on it is breaking the rules. Nobody on it is hacked in. It's verifiable and it's auditable. That's built in. There's a um, rather terrible artist's impression of the Ethereum uh, computer. It's like a world computer. It's there everywhere in the world. <coughs> you can see each one of these red boxes on the outside, that's an external account. That's how we interact with a computer. We have these external accounts that can kind of inject uh, operations, information, into the world computer. <coughs> And within the computer, we have objects. Each object runs in its own kind of address space, if you like. 
like I said, it was enforced. This, of these objects are enforced in the virtual silicon. They can't interfere with each other. The only way that they can uh, interact with each other is by message passing. Classic object orientation stuff, right? Now, the way that we can interact on the outside into the computer is with these uh, external accounts by passing messages from them. The objects can pass messages to each other. They can even go in loops. All the objects have storage. They can remember. When you're using the computer, the only things that cost money are the things that change the computer. So you don't have to pay anything to inspect. You only have to pay if you want to be able to change it. So, I'm going to come back to the objective stuff, but why do we want to have a world computer? What does it give us? What's better about it than the current system? If we had a single computer in the world that everybody uses, it gives a certain number of benefits. Essentially, the computer becomes an innovation commons. It's a commons because we're all, allowed, we're all free to put our code on this computer and to allow it to execute. But of course, the code can interact with other people's code on the computer. We can, we can uh, imagine many systems emerging from these rules-based commons. In comparison, traditional server-based software is going to sit each in its own walled garden. It's very difficult for them to interact between them. Interoperability between servers is difficult. Numerous security concerns, reliability, standards always changing, different software, <coughs> basically becomes a nightmare. Increased barriers. Servers are naturally enforced monopolies. If I run software on my server, I can restrict what you can do with my software. In comparison, if there is a single global computer with very clear, fair rules governing what the software does on it, then no longer do we have this problem of monopolies, of unfairness. For example, suppose you want to integrate payment into your software. You have some software, you just want to integrate payment. How do you do that? Is there something in the programming language? No. How do you do it? Use a library, you know. You go to a third party and you ask them. Sometimes you plead with them and you beg them, please allow me to do this functionality. And if you're really lucky, they might let you with particular restrictions. And finally, servers in some senses are expensive, even compared to Ethereum. You have to set them up, you have to maintain them. In comparison, Ethereum is always ready to process transactions always ready to, to be interacted with. And of course, there's privacy. Servers lead to siloing of user data. They lead to intermediary, intermediaries. And as we've seen time and time again, intermediaries and the siloing of data leads to privacy lapses. Ethereum's security model is quite simple. Nobody can cheat because everybody is checking. It's kind of like security through reduction. There's nothing to secure anymore. If any one individual computer running the Ethereum decentralized global computer is hacked, it won't make any difference to the emergent effect of having a single machine. It can afford to lose one cell in much the same way as the body can afford to lose one cell. Indeed, it can lose an awful lot of stuff before it starts going wrong. And finally, it's all interactions are authenticated. What does this mean in reality? It means you don't have to deal with user accounts. They're already there. And they're much better than anything that you would normally um, be implementing. They're automatically cryptographically signed, secured, and audited. Unauthorized interactions 
broadly speaking, are impossible. So what's the bigger picture? Why bother? Well, because we want to commoditize trust. The big institutions that run much of the economy in the world operate on one thing and one thing alone. It's trust. They can handle such large transaction volumes. They can go further because they have that trust. So what are we going to do? We're going to commoditize trust. In fact, you can look at this global computer as a zero trust computing platform. You don't need to trust anybody to use this platform. And you can do the biggest, the bulkiest transactions without having to worry in many respects about trust at all. It's great for autonomous trading, smart contracts, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Decentralized autonomous organizations are one of the sort of newer, slightly sci-fi stuff that can be implemented. It provides a new kind of insight into what law could be, called crypto law. In the same way that some of the earlier blockchain systems like Bitcoin ushered in crypto finance, the notion that money doesn't have to actually be in a bank or be operated by trusted institutions, it can actually just be free, uh, f flowing freely between the cryptographic certainty of a decentralized network. Ethereum does the same, but it does it in terms of law. Interactions and agreements can be policed in a decentralized fashion. In this sense, Ethereum can be seen to use the blockchain to implement potentially arbitrary social contracts between people. And finally, Web3. What's Web3? Web3 is an application platform for delivering decentralized applications. In this sense, Web3 applications don't need any sort of server infrastructure. Any kind of centralized organization or person sitting in a physical jurisdiction behind them. It's infrastructure for the next revolution in terms of information technology communication. There's a number of different technologies. Ethereum is one of them. Telehash is rather useful in terms of a network backend. Uh, Whisper allows bulletins securely, privately. And finally, IPFS and the variant of IPFS called Swarm allow decentralized file and uh, data storage and publication. Together, they form the basis of Web3. But Web3 is not just these technologies, it's a general technology set that others can add to and that can expand as necessary. The critical thing is that they're decentralized and that there are nice APIs, a holistic API for all of them, um, generally in JavaScript, but bindings are inevitably available. So where are we on the way now? The Ethereum organization, that's roughly its history. Um, this year we made a test net at the beginning, um, that was called Olympic. And we released Frontier um, three or four months afterwards. It's been going for a couple of months now. And that's the first release network. So it's possible to actually do this stuff right now. There are about 30 developers who are in some sense um, affiliated with the foundation um, around the world. It's very decentralized. And there are uh, probably another 100 or so um, kind of tinkerers and volunteers and so on. Um, it's completely free. Um, different licenses are used. C++ is GPL, there is LGPL, Python is uh, MIT. There are various unofficial implementations. Um, it's one of the few technologies for which there are multiple clean room implementations. So you can actually be reasonably certain that the implementations are probably going to work and that the, the specification behind them all is probably unambiguous. I know uh, at least the JavaScript implementation was actually implemented without reference to any of the others. It was only going off the specification. And it worked. Um, so we made the release earlier this year. We've got a few um, improvements to do in the next three to six months. Maybe we'll go for some more funding and hopefully we'll get 
a 2.0 release that will deliver a number of interesting features, including scalability, which will make a lot more of the Internet of Things stuff actually possible. At the moment, it can handle maybe 100 transactions a second, which is not amazing. Um, for the Internet of Things stuff, we'll probably want to be handling tens of thousands. Um, and hardware accelerated is a, a rather useful uh, aspect that we'd like to have, basically, so that we can have the code execute more or less um, what it would execute if it were compiled natively on the platform. 